listening, contemplating, meditating, and realizing. In terms of the process of cultivating wisdom, any teaching imparted by the Buddha has four stages, listening, contemplating, meditating, and realizing. Now, let's explain each of these stages respectively. Stage 1. Listening. In this stage, it's essential to seek a qualified spiritual teacher. Once you find such a teacher, you should earnestly listen to their teachings on the Dharma. When listening to the teachings, you need to observe carefully. Only by listening to one's teachings can you discern whether one is a qualified spiritual teacher. Once you have observed carefully and confirmed that it is the authentic Dharma, you don't need to observe further. This means that you need to observe thoroughly. At that time, we should comprehensively listen and study the teacher's teachings with an open and receptive mind. Only with an open and receptive mind can we avoid misinterpretation. Stage 2. Contemplating By carefully observing, contemplating, experiencing and comprehending the teachings in meditation and in daily life, one can thoroughly understand what the teachings really mean and develop right understanding and view. Therefore, the stage of contemplation is also very important. Stage 3. Meditation. During meditation, we continually cultivate the right view gained through listening and contemplating to replace our previous wrong views. Through continuous practice, it gradually transforms into right mindfulness and right concentration, which will gradually integrate into our daily life and become our inherent quality. This means putting the teachings into practice. While putting the teachings into practice, we continuously transform our karmic habits and views, generate right thoughts, speech, actions, etc., and will ultimately attain enlightenment. While listening, contemplating and meditating, there are some issues to be noted. In terms of the listening stage, there are some prevalent phenomena in society. Some Buddhist scholars don't have faith. They primarily study the Buddha's teachings with an attitude of exploring knowledge and conducting academic research. Those who remain at this stage are scholars who don't have faith. Another group of people are scholars who have faith. They have a habit of studying the Dharma, enjoy delving into profound Buddhist theories, and know many profound Buddhist teachings. They consider themselves remarkable and are quite arrogant. I have encountered many such people. In fact, they haven't even cultivated renunciation and haven't truly let go of fame and fortune in the world. They have strong afflictions such as greed, anger, ignorance, doubt and arrogance, and they don't know how to tame them. In other words, they haven't really started spiritual practice. They have a wall of books at home and study them well. They can talk eloquently, but they haven't made progress in actual practice. Such people are quite arrogant. It's difficult to communicate with them. If you discuss actual practice with them, they will look down upon you because they consider themselves remarkable. This is a group of people. Such problems can arise during the stage of listening. In terms of the contemplation stage, some Buddhist monastics, despite having ordained and started spiritual practice, still focus on thinking. 
They enjoy contemplating the Dharma teachings, use logical reasoning to make inferences, summarize and organize Buddhist knowledge and principles, and then publish them. After their works are published, they gain fame and fortune. As a result, the study of the Dharma becomes a means to obtain their fame and fortune. Nowadays, this phenomenon is prevalent. To put it bluntly, this is selling at the Dharma. By studying and explaining the Dharma, then charging money and publishing books, they gain fame and fortune. They are selling at the Dharma. However, they don't truly practice and don't truly benefit sentient beings. They don't guide their disciples, nor do they make any efforts. After acquiring wealth, they don't use it to benefit practitioners. To discern whether someone is a qualified spiritual teacher is actually quite easy. You can just check what they do with the offerings they receive. After such people gain fame and fortune, they will definitely receive offerings. Those who are unfamiliar with the Dharma may consider them highly accomplished and support them. If they use the money to train monastics and support genuine practitioners instead of engaging in charitable activities to get fame and fortune, Helping the impoverished solve their problems might be a means to gain fame and fortune, which is pointless. As humans, we should work hard. In fact, in this society, as long as you work hard a little bit, you won't starve. If there is an earthquake or plague, we should certainly offer help. When others encounter difficulties, we should help them. However, in peaceful times without disasters, plagues, droughts or floods, there's no reason for a normal person to starve. If someone is disabled, we should certainly help them. However, as a healthy person, unless you are difficult to get along with, how can you be poor? The problem definitely lies in yourself. In this era, as long as you work, you can make a living. I have been to many rural areas and find that many hope schools have become abandoned vacant buildings. This phenomenon is quite common. Many rural children have moved to the cities, leaving the hope schools vacant. How much money has been spent on this project? It's really a waste of money. What's the use of it? Moreover, during the rural toilet project, many toilets were built. However, they are now smelly and dirty because there is no water. So, you never know if this is doing good deeds or not. Well, this is another topic. Those who remain in the contemplation stage are considered Buddhist theorists or philosophers. They think deeper, so it's easier for them to gain fame and fortune. After completing the foundation stages of listening and contemplation, practitioners should engage in a meditation practice to eliminate confusions and afflictions. Firstly, we need to eliminate confusions. We should recognize that the conclusions derived through logical reasoning are completely different from the realization, experience and insight gained through actual practice. Therefore, we should set actual practice as the right direction The stages of listening, contemplation and meditation support and complement each other. If you listen to a teaching again after meditating on it, you will gain a deeper understanding. Only through repeated cycles of listening, contemplation and meditation can you truly develop a firm conviction and make progress in meditation.
Consequently, you can eliminate all confusions in your mind. The wisdom and realization you attain will illuminate your mind and dispel all confusions and afflictions, like the sun penetrating thick clouds. Listening, contemplating, meditating and realizing are four stages of cultivating wisdom. We should bear this in mind. From the perspective of the results, any Dharma practice encompasses four aspects, faith, conviction, practice and enlightenment. By continuously listening, one can gradually develop faith infused with wisdom. By continuously contemplating and experiencing, one can cultivate a firm conviction without doubt. By continuously meditating and practicing, one will naturally attain enlightenment. However, this process usually refers to the path of accumulation and the path of joining. The so-called enlightenment refers to entering the path of seeing. Before entering the path of seeing, the stages of any Dharma practice encompasses faith, conviction, practice and enlightenment. After entering the path of seeing, it is all about actual practice, which can be divided into four stages, the path of seeing, the path of meditation, the path of practice and the path of fruition. Enlightenment means entering the path of seeing, and what is seen is emptiness. The emptiness in the Theravada tradition refers to no self in person, while the emptiness in the Mahayana tradition refers to no self in phenomena, that is, dependent arising and the nature of emptiness, which is the wisdom of Mahayana bodhisattvas. So, The path of seeing can be categorized into the Theravada one, the Mahayana one, and the one in the Supreme Vehicle. The path of seeing in the Supreme Vehicle refers to the realization of the emptiness of the Great Middle Way, or Yogacara, which are actually two sides of the same coin. The Great Middle Way is expounded from the perspective of emptiness. It is the definitive teaching the Buddha expounded in the third turning of the Dharma wheel. The teachings of the three vehicles were taught by the Buddha during the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. Each vehicle has its own path of seeing, and what is seen is different. This is the system based on gradual teachings. On the other hand, The system based on direct realization, also known as the Chan school, is not about entering the path of seeing, but about seeing the nature of the mind and realizing the truth of reality. This is beyond the scope of the teachings of the three vehicles. After the path of seeing, the next stage is the path of meditation. This meditation is different from the meditation stage of cultivating wisdom before entering the path of seeing. The meditation in this context refers to the meditation practice after entering the path of seeing, seeing the truth. After seeing the truth, one still needs to practice in order to maintain the state of enlightenment. After seeing the truth, the affliction of doubt is eradicated, which is very important. Therefore, during meditation, there is no need to intentionally direct one's thoughts. By arousing mindfulness, one can directly abide in right concentration. For example, After realizing no self in person through practicing the path to liberation in the Theravada tradition, 
One can directly abide in the state of no self in person during meditation, thereby overcoming afflictions such as desire, anger, and arrogance, as well as ego and pride. The third stage is practice. It means that after meditation, when facing various situations in daily life, one can arouse mindfulness and abide in the wisdom of no self in person to overcome various afflictions, karmic habits and wrong views. The second stage, meditation, mainly refers to dedicated sitting meditation, while practice mainly refers to integrating the practice into daily life. That is why we often say meditation and practice. The meditation discussed earlier mainly refers to dedicated sitting meditation. What is practiced is the same, whether it is practiced in sitting meditation or in daily life. They are both about abiding in no self and overcoming afflictions. Of course, we need to start with sitting meditation. It's easier to practice in sitting meditation because your mind is focused without distractions. It's harder to practice in daily life. Without the foundation of sitting meditation, it's impossible to practice in daily life, right? If you cannot even make any progress in sitting meditation, how can you practice in daily life which is full of distractions? Only when you are proficient in sitting meditation can you practice in daily life. Therefore, we should establish a solid foundation. For example, as you become more familiar with the three types of suffering and impermanence during sitting meditation, you can also contemplate the three types of suffering, the suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and the all-pervasive suffering, and impermanence while working or in your daily life. Gradually, this will be also beneficial for cultivating renunciation and the wisdom of no self in person. Currently, when you practice alone, it's better to spend more time listening to the teachings on the path to liberation. When you are alone, you can practice the path to liberation. When you work for the benefit of sentient beings together with the team, you can cultivate bodhicitta and put your aspirations into action. After listening to teachings on generating bodhicitta and practicing it together, we develop some faith and aspiration. With that, we can work for the benefit of sentient beings. In this way, when we work at least, we will have a similar bodhicitta and fewer selfish intentions. Before your class, you need to practice bodhicitta together and make aspirations. Primarily, you can chant the bodhicitta prayers together. The stages are the path of seeing, the path of meditation, the path of practice, and the path of fruition. The final stage is the attainment of the perfect fruit. In the Ravada, there are fruits such as Arhatship. In Mahayana, there are various levels of Buddhasattvas. In the Supreme Vehicle, there are Buddhasattvas of skillful teachings, as well as Buddhasattvas of exclusive teachings, which are higher levels of Buddhasattvas. The supreme vehicle has its own fruits and different levels of bodhisattvas. The fruits of the three vehicles are different. During the Buddha's three turnings of the Dharma wheel, there are different paths of seeing, different stages and different fruits. From the perspective of the Chan school or the great perfection, there are no stages. 
In Tibetan Buddhism, it is called the Great Perfection, which actually shares the same perspective as the Chan school in Chinese Buddhism. This is because if you really attain that state, you have transcended all teachings. If you attain a supreme realization state that transcends all teachings, it is the special transmission outside the scriptures, beyond stages. This is because in the system based on direct realization, there are no stages, no path of seeing, no path of meditation, no path of practice, and no path of fruition. There is no seer and what is seen, no meditator and what is meditated, no practitioner and what is practiced, no realizer and what is realized. The subject and the object are one. To put it another way, the stages of seeing, meditation, practice and fruition have become one. Seeing is also meditation, practice and fruition. Meditation is also seeing, practice and fruition. Practice is also seeing, meditation and fruition. Fruition is also seeing, meditation and practice. In other words, each stage contains the other three stages and they merge into one. This is the great sublime state of great Chan masters, and we are just gaining some knowledge of it. Why do we talk about it? It's because some people are quite arrogant, so I share this to let them know what the Chan school is. This is a high state, and we are just gaining a brief knowledge about it. The fourth part is about the spiritual states of the Chan school and the great perfection, which transcend stages. Those who have attained enlightenment practice in this way. Enlightened beings have no discrimination, no views, and no right knowledge and understanding. At that time, they have transcended right knowledge and view nor do they abide. They have no attachment to the so-called right knowledge and view mentioned earlier. There is no wisdom, no attainment. All notions, including wisdom and right view, are gone. If you still cling to the notion of right knowledge and views, you haven't even touched the entrance of the Chan school. You don't belong to the direct path at all. If you were to say something like that, the great masters would rebuke you. Who gave you the right to speak? How dare you talk about right knowledge and view with me? So, what we impart are teachings of the gradual path, and we are practitioners of the gradual path. If you claim to be a practitioner of the direct path, then let me test you. React to the challenge I present to you. In the past, the great masters would directly overturn your meditation seat. You need to have real spiritual attainment, which cannot be made up. So, don't daydream. If you do, you are wasting time. It's enough for you to have a brief knowledge of this.